Um, good morning, everyone, and can I welcome you to the 15th meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones off or other devices to silent so they don't uh, disrupt our meeting? And we have uh, a full complement as of about four seconds' time. Um, so no apology has been received. We've got a, a full team here today. And we move to agenda item one, decision to take uh, business in private. The committee is asked to agree that agenda item three, consideration of evidence and four, consideration of a draft report, are taken in private. Is the committee agreed to this? Agreed. Okay, thank you. The committee is also asked to agree that consideration of its work programme is taken in private at our next meeting and to take future considerations of the draft report that we're looking at this morning in private. Is the committee agreed to this? Okay. Thank you. We now move to agenda item two, Audit Scotland reports. The committee will take evidence on the Auditor General for Scotland's report, Social Security implementing the devolved powers. And can I welcome Caroline Gardner, mm -hmm. Audit, Auditor General for Scotland, and her team, Mark Taylor, Audit Director, Audit Scotland, Gemma Diamond, Senior Manager, Audit Scotland, and Kirsty Ridd, Senior Auditor, Audit Scotland. Uh, you're all very welcome this morning. Thank you for coming along to the committee. And can I invite Ms Gardner to make an opening statement before we move to questions? Thank you, Convener. I'm pleased to bring my latest report on how the Scottish Government is managing the delivery of the new Social Security powers to the committee today. The report looks at progress up to the end of February this year, while taking account of the activity that's still underway. The Scottish Government has done well to deliver the commitments it made for the last year. This includes launching the Social Security Scotland Agency, which is responsible for delivering the benefits as they're devolved. As you know, the agency became operational in September 2018, and it now employs over 320 staff. And the Government has launched the first two benefits, the Carers Allowance Supplement and the Best Start Grant Pregnancy and Baby Payment. The Social Security programme has also undertaken important groundwork to support the delivery of future benefits and promote its aims of fairness, dignity and respect. This includes publishing the first Social Security Charter and establishing the Scottish Commission on Social Security. The programme has also continued to engage people who will use the new systems in the design process. However, delivery of the new benefits has been harder than expected. The programme has been working flat out, and the scale and complexity of the work involved has been, become clearer as teams plan the delivery of individual benefits. The programme has continued to find it difficult to recruit the skills and experience it needs among its staff, leading to greater than expected reliance on temporary and contractor staff and pressure on the staff that it does have. The programme has done well to respond to the challenges to date, but the processes and systems it's currently using to plan and support implementation will not be enough to support the next stages. The programme's financial reporting has improved, but it hasn't been monitoring or reporting how much it will cost to fully implement all the benefits. Delivering the second wave of benefits will be a significant challenge. Wave 2 benefits involve more complex assessments and regular payments that affect people's day-to-day -day income. The programme is carrying out a wide range of work to prepare for the next stage of delivery, including revising the overarching business case, reviewing the governance and planning processes, and work to address the resourcing challenges. The programme is doing the right things, and it is committed to learning lessons, but there's a risk that the pace of work and the constant delivery pressures may not allow the team the time and space they need to make change quickly enough. Finally, the Scottish Government does not yet have a clear understanding of the key things needed to deliver all the remaining benefits in the way it intends, and it now needs to develop its critical path of planned actions for the rest of the programme. Convener, I'm joined by colleagues who worked on the report, and we're happy to answer the committee's questions. Can I thank you for that opening statement, and we'll move to questions now. Uh, Alison Johnson. Thank you, thank you Convener, um, and good morning, and, and thank you for, for the report. Um, the challenges to date have obviously not been insignificant, but um, I, I think it's fair to say they, they, that those challenges have been met. But you're clearly expressing concerns about the increased challenge in delivering the next wave of benefits, um, some of which are, are, are more complex. And the three forms of disability assistance, I think they'll easily be the biggest part of the new system, accounting for well over half of current spending. And disability assistance for children and young people is launching next summer and the report makes a lot of reference to the Scottish Government needing to do more to be ready for these wave two payments um, but I'd like to know more about the level of preparation for those disability assistance uh, benefits in particular so could you just you know expand on what has been done particularly well so far 
and whether or not you believe everything can be in place to successfully deliver these really important benefits next year. Um, I'll kick off, Ms Johnston, and then ask members of the team to give you a bit more detail, if that's OK. Um, we think the groundwork that the programme has put in place is exactly the right groundwork. Um, the ability to um, put in place the programme staff and the agency, um, ways of working, some of the key systems and processes that will be needed for all of the benefits, that's in hand. Um, as the committee knows, the government has prioritised safe and secure delivery throughout this, and for that reason, the first wave of benefits are the ones which are deliberately easier to manage. They tend to have smaller caseloads, they're easier to as assess, um, and they're one-off payments rather than regular payments. You're quite right, as we move into the disability um, benefits, those, st those things start to reverse. Much bigger caseloads, harder to assess people's eligibility, and the need to make regular payments that may change from week to week and month to month. Um, so I'll ask the team to pick up what we think are the particular challenges um, and where the focus needs to be as we move into that, that next phase of work. Okay, Mark, do you thank want you. to pick that up? Yep, thank you. I think the, the, we, we set out in the report the, essentially where the planning horizon is at the moment and that there's a lot of detailed work put into what's coming next uh, at the moment, and that's completion of Wave uh, 1 benefits and early work for Wave 2 benefits. And one of the things we're clear about is there needs to be more of an overall sense of what that overall plan is to, in order to de de uh, deliver the whole range of benefits, including disability uh, benefits as we go forward. I have a clearer idea of what the, the main milestones are, where the critical decision points are and how all of that fits together to enable some more of that detailed planning. The approach the government's taking is one, to, to learn as it goes and to uh, uh, take an agile approach in, in, in terms of building systems incrementally as they go on. What we're clear about is, is as well as that, there needs to be that greater view of what are the key things that need to happen in what order to get the delivery of the benefits, including disability benefits and the time scales that have been set out. I don't know if colleagues want to add. Um, I suppose it's just to build on that agile point that, that Mark um, was just making there in terms of that kind of iterative process and for us it's that clear understanding includes kind of what some of those key dependencies are so to for certain benefits what, what are some of the systems that will be required and also what parts of the system will be developed over time so if and um, that also kind of affects the procurement timescales as well. So for us, it's about that kind of critical path, which shows out what some of those dependencies are, that if one procurement decision isn't made in the right time frame, what knock-on impact that might have across all the different benefits. And as Mark kind of said, what order those decisions need to be made, because there are certain things such as some of the digital systems that will affect a mul multiple different benefits. Um, so for us, that um, critical path is key to understanding that over a kind of longer time frame. The programme does have a lot of planning in place. They do um, have kind of lots of individual project plans that set things out, but what we're looking at is something that kind of sits above that over a longer time frame in terms of a critical path. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose if, you know, it's obviously key that we have sufficient staff and so on in place, and I know that colleagues are going to pick up that line of questioning, but. Um, if we have a system that isn't working as smoothly as it might be, then we're more likely to see errors um, arise in that system. And those errors can lead to overpayment and indeed underpayment, which can, it can be particularly devastating, um, neither of which are welcome. And DWP statistics tell us that just one of the payments being devolved, PIP, had across the UK £600 million worth of, of, of payment error um, in 2018-19 including over £340 million of underpayment. So if we take a, a rough Scottish share, you know, we might be looking at £34 million worth of, of underpayment, um, and that's just for one form of assistance. So, you know, I'd just like to understand, um, you know, what the Scottish Government might do to reduce that level of error. You're absolutely right that that's one of the challenges that the Scottish Government is having to work with, that it, it's taking on responsibility at the moment for benefits that have been historically administered by DWP and across the whole social security system in the UK there have been very high levels of error um, and fraud which have led to the DWP's accounts being qualified over a number of years. Now um, as those benefits are coming across and um, as as existing claimants um, are being taken on, the government will need to have plans for how it will tackle that challenge. 
as the committee knows at the moment, what the government is doing is taking on new claims, um, and it has the um, opportunity to put in place its own, um, not just eligibility criteria, but assessment processes. Um, it's focusing more on face-to-face um, -face and um, assisted uh, processes for people to make their claims, to make sure they're getting what they're entitled to, and not more or less than that. Um, and as we say in the report, it will have to consider how well that's going as it moves on to these new benefits that have got more claimants and more money involved. Um, I think it's where the principles of dignis, dignity, fairness and respect become so important. Um, but it's absolutely part of what the audit team led by Mark Taylor will be looking at as they move into the um, first year's audit of the agency itself to look at how well that's been done for the first wave of benefits and what the preparations are as we move into these much bigger, more complex ones in future. Mark, do you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you. I, th I think it's, wor it's worth stating, uh, and I know this is understood, that, that the nature of benefits, given their complexity, given that, that for claimants and for officials they're difficult to navigate, particularly as more and more uh, benefits come in, you have the interplay between reserve benefits and, and uh, devolved benefits going forward, m makes it a very complex uh, system and very complex uh, uh, system to navigate. And there's an inherent risk of fraud, fraud and error in, the, in that system. Uh, we found when we did our work earlier this year that the agency and government's understanding of what it means in practice for the benefits that are being de uh, devolved now is at an early stage and there's more work that needs to be done around that. And as the Auditor General says, that's be very much a focus of our work that's ongoing at the moment, looking at the agency's accounts for the first year. That combination of what can the agency do for new benefits that it's taking on responsibility for and what are the continuing uh, impacts of uh, the, uh, the underlying systems at DW. Uh, uh, provide and uh, that the agency will continue to use in some areas. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask a, a, a couple of questions on that? I, I suppose um, the question revolves around um, the risks that um, the Auditor General is highlighting in terms of the more complex and demanding nature of, of Wave 2 benefits. And at Section 95 of the report, I see in relation to that it says there's a significant amount of work underway to prepare for the next stage of delivery, uh, but this will need to be implemented quickly. And I'll just uh, briefly note 95, the programme and its staff show a good level of self-awareness and willingness to reflect and challenge themselves in progress. But given the ongoing challenge and demand of delivering the rest of the Wave 1 benefits alongside the work to design and implement Wave 2 benefits, there is a significant risk, and it's a significant risk when we come back, that the programme doesn't have the time and capacity to learn from experience to date and make the changes necessary to successfully deliver on wave two timescales. That's almost like a self-contradictory statement. It kind of says that things are going well, they're aware of the risks, they're taking steps, but there's still significant risks. So I'm just, I was looking further on the report, it talks about at 102, it talks about um, changing the management structures and redesignating job specifications of some senior management recruiting additional skill levels that are required at this stage to deliver stage two. So there seems to be like a dynamic with, with, within the organisation that are identifying these significant risks and taking appropriate action to mitigate them. So, I mean, I, I don't doubt there will be significant risks. There must be when you're dealing with this level of complexity. That's, that, that's de facto the situation. I suppose what I'm looking for is, is your views on whether you think the actions that Social Security Scotland and the Scottish Government are taking are adequate to identify and mitigate the risks that uh, the, this report outlines? I think we would say at this stage we think they're probably doing all that they can and that what they can do can't um, eliminate those risks altogether. Um, so, for example, um, we know that the Scottish Government will need to continue to work very closely with DWP, not just until 2024, but for the continuing future, um, because, for example, of the extent to which some UK-wide benefits are qualifying eligibility criteria for Scottish benefits. So that relationship will continue to be there. And some of the problems that Mark was outlining about levels of error and fraud in, in DWP are something that the Scottish Government will have to um, manage and respond to. Um, 
we say at the top of page 31 that um, getting the right staff in place will be absolutely key to addressing some of the, the risks that we've identified here. And we know that the agency and the programme are struggling to do that in some areas, particularly um, digital skills and business analyst skills. They're in short supply across Scotland. So there's a, a risk that no matter how hard the uh, programme works to look to recruit those skills, they will still have gaps which will get in the way. And one last thing just to mention is that um, some of the work that is having to be done to deal with the complexity that's being uncovered and understood um, has the, uh, the, the consequence of increasing the work that still requires to be done. So we talk in here about the workaround that was needed to check eligibility for the um, pregnancy and baby payment of the Best Start grant. That was a, a good thing to do to make sure people got their money on time um, and that it cut down errors of uh, levels of error. But equally, the work to get the, the proper interface between t the two systems in place still remains to be done. So there's that sort of snowplow effect of work moving forward as, as workarounds are put in place to solve immediate problems. So I, I recognise your sense that we're, we're sort of having our cake and eating it by saying they've done very well and the risks remain, but that's genuinely our assessment at the moment of where the programme is. Really good progress to date and a lot of significant right. and complex work to come. And I absolutely think that that's, that's completely reasonable. I suppose I was just trying to get a sense of whether uh, the government and uh, Social Security of Scotland are cited on those risks, they're aware of them, and they're, they're seeking to mitigate, manage them uh, appropriately. And, and I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but I think, I think that's what you're saying, that you didn't identify risks that the organisation was not aware of and are seeking to take steps to, to deal with. Would that be a reasonable position to, to we, take? We say in the report very clearly that the programme is self-aware and okay. is doing the right things. The, the, the thing we also say, though, is that it's really um, essential now that they do have that critical path for delivering all of the devolved yeah. benefits, um, as Gemma was describing, to understand what the key decision points are, what the interactions are, mm -hmm. and what the effect will be if some of those things slip or encounter unexpected problems. That, that's helpful. We'll move on. Uh, Alistair Allen. Thank you very much. Um, I was interested in some of what the report had to say um, 78, 79 and thereabouts um, about the digital arrangements for the new benefits and I was curious um, really to know how this relates to some of the, the um, more antiquated systems that exist for certain reserve benefits and not only for reserve benefits but obviously the communication that exists between the new agency and the DWP. There are some uh, parts I believe of, of the DWP which still operate on paper based systems from 1948 so I'm curious to know a little bit more about what you found about the digital side of, of the new arrangements. I'm going to ask Gemma to pick that up, who's our expert on digital. <laughs> um, so what we've seen is that the programme has really good um, relationships with DWP in terms of kind of understanding what, what those systems are that work in DWP and how some of their, the new system that they're building will interact with those DWP systems. It is fair to say that the DWP systems are very complex. They have individual systems for individual benefits that then have to kind of talk to each other. Um, and the approach that the Scottish Government has taken is to build one system for all, for all benefits, to avoid that kind of um, having to talk to each other. Um, it is also fair to say that there will need to be a kind of long-term relationship with DWP in terms of the Scot Scottish Government system being able to get information from the DWP systems and being able to talk to each other. The Scottish Government has also made um, some decisions for the short term to make use of some of the systems that, that DWP has. So, for example, the Scottish Government doesn't currently have a payments platform that would be able to cope with the volume of payments that go out through the social security system. So they have an interim agreement um, with the DWP to use their payments platform to make those payments, whilst the Scottish Government centrally within the Digital Directorate has an ongoing um, project to look at a payments platform um, for Scotland. Um, it also is making use of the um, kind of customer information um, system within DWP that allows them to check whether um, a claimant has the kind of passported benefits for eligibility. So for Best Start Grant, there are some underlying benefits that people need to be um, need to be on to be eligible, and they can use a DWP system to check that. So there are lots of different interactions um, and kind of ways that the systems will need to interact over time, but the Scottish Government has taken a different approach to building the new benefits system. Okay. I'm interested uh, on, the, on what you're saying there uh, also about some of the technical issues you pointed out. I don't claim any 
understanding of the technical issues, but it was interesting that you said um, that when the contract was agreed, the programme understood that the DWP owned a key piece of coding that would be required. This was not the case and required the programme to negotiate the purchase of the coding from a third party. So do you think there are obstacles in the way that, that create difficulties or costs for the Scottish Government arising from issues like that? I think you know we've made it clear in the report, and I think quite a few times that this is a really complex situation. And as kind of um, the Scottish government and the DWP get further into kind of looking at how these things will interact, further complexities will arise. That that code is is one of those. The um, um, best start grant and the need to kind of use different arrangements as a c the component wasn't wasn't ready for the, for um, the go live w are examples of that and um, there will probably be further examples of that in, in the future as these complexities arise but um, the Scottish government has had good contingency arrangements in place to manage that so they saw that that was going to happen they put contingencies in place and delivery still went ahead kind of per, per the time scale so there are good enough relationships there that they, they have the right contingency in place. And clearly, the relationships are there, but the, the example I've given would, if I read it correctly, tend to suggest that there were there were costs involved for the Scottish Government because of an action at the DWP end. Is, is that is that a pattern? I mean, when I say costs, I mean uh, costs arising from trying to fix a problem that that appeared to be created there. So there were costs arising in that case in terms of them needing to kind of purchase the code. Um, that's a, that is one an isolated example at the moment. We don't have any further examples um, of that nature at the moment. Okay, thank you. Mark Griffin. Thank you, Camera. <coughs> the the timeline you've said in the report that the timeline of de delivery for entitlements is clear, um, but that the workforce and financial planning to support that timeline um, isn't yet in place. Are you able to see what some of the gaps are on that workforce and financial planning um, are at the moment and what, what are the, the blockages in having those plans in place? Um, exhibit one, as you say, sets out um, the Scottish Government's plans for delivering the new benefits, the devolved benefits to new claimants, and then by 2024 transferring across all existing claimants. Um, so that timeline is in place. And as Gemma said, there are um, project plans for the individual benefits that sit underneath that. What we're not seeing yet is, is the sort of overarching plan that would pull all of that together to be really clear what the key decision points are, um, what needs to be in place to make sure that everything else can follow, um, and what the dependencies are if one benefit is planning to rely on a system that needs to be in place for another benefit. So having that overarching programme is one of the things that we think is now urgently needed. Once that's there, it's possible to um, put in place the more detailed plans for finance to know what needs to be spent in each of the years between now and 2024 to get it up and running and to look at um, which staff are required for each of those sort of key bits of work as it happens. Um, I said in response to Mr Allen's question that um, digital skills were one of the things that is um, lacking at the moment, and that's not just for this programme, it's Scotland-wide. But it does mean that government needs to have a really clear picture of when people be, will be required to develop and deliver a particular solution to make sure they're there and can then move on to work on another um, benefit at the right point, rather than risking people being tied up elsewhere in the programme or in the government at a point where their presence is, is key here. Gemma, do you want to build on that a bit? Absolutely. So um, that critical path is, is really important. And what we see is the need for both the kind of delivery timescales to work very much with the, the workforce plan and also with the, um, the finance plan. So the three kind of sit together and support each other. That's also being done under a kind of revision of the overall business case that's underway at the moment, which again is kind of just um, allowing the programme to reset in terms of kind of um, it's its overall case and its overall priorities. So essentially, delivery is, is not just about the timescales, it's about what is being delivered at each case, what that minimum, they call it a minimum viable product. So it's something that is enough to be to enable delivery, but that will be further built on over time. It's part of that iterative approach. And it's really key to kind of say, well, actually, what does that minimum viable product need to look like at each time? How will we build on that over time? Um, and that forms part of that critical path as well. Okay. And on the financial plan in, in particular, is it, is it possible to, to, to develop a, a detailed financial plan at this point before um, things like level of payments, eligibility criteria 
um, and things like that are, are fully defined? Is, is it possible to have a, a financial plan? I think it's possible to revise the initial estimate um, in, a, in a way which is informed by everything that's been achieved so far. Um, so the bill was the financial memorandum set out a setup cost of three hundred and eight million pounds for the programme and the agency. Um, so far, um, the government has spent about eighty seven million pounds. I think the team will keep me straight. Um, and some of the decisions that have been taken to date will change that 308 million estimate. The government always recognised that that was taken without knowing some key things and in advance of some decisions that would have long-term consequences. But two years in, it's very timely to revise it. Um, and it will need to be revised again, I'm sure. But to do that means that both the programme, um, the government as a whole, and this committee can be uh, monitoring how much is being spent, um, making sure that the overall costs are affordable within the total Scottish budget and getting a sense of what's costing more and less than was expected and therefore um, what will be required for the remaining period. Um, it's, it's never going to be an absolutely accurate figure, but I think it is important that it's now revised from the initial financial memorandum figure to take account of where we've reached at this point. Okay, and finally, can we now, um, Alison Johnson touched on the, the first um, disability payment um, being expected to be in place um, for, for next summer. Um, ha have the necessary decisions been taken to allow that to happen? Is there any risk to, to that time scale, that timetable of the, um, that first entitlement being delivered next summer? Um, yeah, and I don't know if you want to come in on the digital mm -hmm. side of it, but I think um, we have seen obviously there's a lot of groundwork going on for that benefit and um, there's planning in place um, albeit with the comments that have already been made about the higher level planning but one of the key things um, that we'll need to see move forward over the next year is the digital infrastructure for that um, benefit to be launched and we know there's work going on to appoint the contractor to make the necessarily can changes or developments onto the systems that are already there um, and that'll be a key element of progressing that benefit. I don't know if you want to add anything. Absolutely. And it's also, I suppose, you know, for each of the individual benefits, obviously the, the regulations have to be kind of um, set and laid and, and through Parliament. There's also, that, as Kirsty said, the necessary infrastructure changes to be made in terms of getting that system ready. There's also the kind of, not just the digital infrastructure, but the wider infrastructure for de delivering a benefit that is of a different nature in terms of got a different kind of eligibility criteria and more into moving into that kind of assessment um, nature as well. So there's those decisions to be made. I think what we can see is that there is planning in place to allow those decisions to be made. I think our understand our, what, what we're talking about when we're talking about the critical path is something that sits above that over a longer term time frame, but the individual kind of project plans pick up on those individual items. Okay, thank you. Okay, Pauline, do you want to come? Thank you, uh, good morning. Um, I've got two lines of question. The first is just kind of an overview, and then the second I want to just ask about um, de de delivering the kind of uh, new approach to dignity and respect. Um, so just starting with um, the general overview. So when I first read your report, I was alarmed at the number of times that you used the word serious challenge, significant challenge, uh, significant resource challenges. So that has concerned me about the deliverability of um, I know it's the agency and the, the benefits programme itself. Uh, we heard from the Scottish Government last week. I felt less alarmed. Um, I felt quite reassured by what they had to say when we put this to them. Uh, so my question is, um, do you have any serious concerns that the Scottish Government cannot deliver in these timescales? Or are you just reminding them along the way you know, you just need to get there. Um, we, th we think they genuinely laid um, strong foundations for the next stage. Um, you can see that in the way the Wave 1 benefits have been delivered and some of the building blocks have been put in place. And I hope you've got a sense from what the team have described about how the programme has done that. And we know that the Wave 2 benefits are a really significant step up. 
Um, the benefits that have been um, delivered so far will account for about 2% of the total spend on, on Social Security benefits by 2024, the 3.5 billion. We're talking about 2% of that. Much smaller caseloads, much more straightforward to assess people's eligibility and on the whole one-off payments rather than regular payments that um, are the bulk of people's day-to-day -day living income. Um, the government itself, I think, recognises the scale of the challenge that it faces. It's been very clear that it's prioritising safe and secure delivery. I think that's the right choice. Um, as we say in the report and as the team have described, people are self-aware about what needs to happen. And there's a lot of work going on to learn from experience. So um, after the uh, pregnancy and baby grant launched, there was a review of um, what worked well, what can be done better next time, and, and lessons learned. That's all really good stuff. But there is a risk that, um, first of all, the people um, needed to deliver it may not be available. We've, we're talking about a vacancy rate of about 30% at the time our report was finalised, particularly in relation to digital skills, programme management skills. Um, and we think the other thing that would really help to manage those risks is that clear timeline from here through to 2024 of all the things that need to happen for the programme as a whole, rather than for delivering the individual benefits that we set out on um, Exhibit 1. Um, we really hope that that all works well, and there is a risk that it may not, and the government would then have to um, think through its own contingency planning uh, for how it responded to that um, and what workarounds may be possible. We know it's done that in the past. We've got an exhibit around the pregnancy and baby grant where the interface wasn't available um, and a manual workaround was put in place. Where that happens again, it has a knock-on effect. So it's understanding the programme as a whole and managing it very actively, I think, is the best response to the risk which we genuinely think exists. Apologies if this is a very basic question, but um, so Audit Scotland's role in all of this, so when do you... So when will we hear from you again about what progress you think the government are making in this? Um, well, as of now, we are auditing Social Security Scotland's accounts as an agency, um, and Mark will be leading that audit, and um, I'll be reporting it in the usual way in the autumn. We, we then have a continuing stream of work in the performance audit programme, um, which will follow up on this report in a, in a sort of wider way uh, during 2020, uh, given its scale um, in terms of the, the money spent and, more importantly, the impact on people's lives. So we'll, we'll continue to monitor it. Thinking in the autumn. Indeed. And then follow year, exactly. we'll know what you're thinking then. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to now move to the question of delivering a system with dignity and respect. Um, so you'll know, hopefully through the passage of the um, bill now, the Act, that there will be several differences from the DWP system. So one of those is that the redetermination process will be different. And crucially, um, we are... Um, the applicant's not been successful in the redetermination, um, that they have the right of appeal, but we've got a commitment in the Act that the paperwork will follow the, uh, to the tribunal should the person. Um, this is all about accessibility, the appeal system and so on. Um, do you look at that level of detail or whether or not the agency can deliver on these commitments within the principles of the, of the Social Security Act? We can look at that as part of the future performance audit work. Um, the, the general principle is that it's for government to set policy, and it's been very clear about its commitment to dignity, fairness and respect. Um, it's now setting out its plans for what that means in practice, um, and in future audit work we can come back and look at how well that's being delivered. There's clearly a very important role for the Social Security Commission um, and for uh, the Social Security Charter in all of this, and we recognise the progress that's been made in setting those up here. Um, but we can look at how well um, those elements of the process are working as part of our wider look at the way this policy is being delivered. To know because you would require a different system than the DWP because you're requiring your staff, your systems within your staff to do something different, but you will be looking at that, that's what you're saying. I think it's another example of where there have been real achievements so far and the next, the next wave of benefits, that becomes more complex and more uh, resource intensive to do well. So we'll be looking at how that's being set up. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's just worth putting on record, because the Deputy Commissioner mentioned um, evidence we got from the Scottish Government that on the 2nd of May the Scottish Government also wrote to the Committee uh, in, in relation to its response to your report, uh, much of which it, it welcomed, and that, that, that's in the public domain on our website if anyone following Committee proceedings wants, wants to have a look at that. Uh, we'll move to Keith Brown, followed by Jeremy Balfour. 
Uh, thanks very much. I, just looking at the issue that uh, has been raised by the Deputy Convener about whether this is a process that's being uh, rushed or not, and I notice that uh, Section 43, you've given the example of a decision which was discussed at three board meetings of the Delivery Board, uh, and your conclusion is to suggest that more time is required. Is that your view? Personally, I would have thought maybe they should take a decision a bit earlier than that, but um, is that your view that these benefits and implementation of them, the delivery of them, is being rushed and it requires more time in general? Um, I, on the general um, point, Mr Brown, I, I can't see the exact reference, but we say a bit later in the report that it's hard to see how a programme of this scale could be delivered more quickly than it is being, uh, particularly given the, com the government's commitment to prioritising um, safe and secure delivery. That was one example of a decision that took longer than expected um, and had to be taken out with the normal governance processes to make sure there wasn't a knock-on effect on um, other parts of the programme. Gemma, do you want to say a bit more about it? Absolutely. I think what we've seen is that the, the programme has really good kind of programme governance arrangements in place in terms of having the right governance and boards and kind of flow of information through. What we've seen over the last year is that increasingly that kind of pace that the programme moves at is finding that some of those boards are finding it increasingly difficult to manage the volume of information that was going through, particularly one of the key boards is called the delivery board. And that was getting a lot of information through and it was finding it quite hard to make um, to manage that volume of information. And that was one of the examples that we saw. Where actually, this was a really, really big decision and a big de a decision that was key to how the rest of the... would affect the rest of the programme, essentially, because it was, it was on a key system, that actually um, being able to give enough time and space for it within the governance boards and have the right support to be able to allow the SRO to make a fully informed decision, um, we felt that, that whilst that was within the SRO's role and within governance, that allowing a little bit more time might have enabled the SRO to have a kind of more fully supported decision on that. What we do know is that the programme itself acknowledges that um, some of those governance mechanisms won't be right for Wave 2 and is looking at that to make sure that the delivery board can manage the, the information that comes through, that the programme board, which is, I suppose, the most senior board within the programme, is getting the right level of information about some of the significant decisions that are being made in terms of significant procurement decisions and business cases, so that it has a greater role in some of those very key decisions. So we know that, the, the, again, the programme is aware of some of those issues and are taking them on board and trying to rework some of the governance arrangements so that it can cope with that pace and more complex information moving into wave two. Thanks very much. Sorry, Mr. Taylor, did you want to come Apologies, Keith. Dad, a kind of overview. I think one of the things that we're, we're clear about and from what we've seen is there's so much to do. There's, there's so many things to do. And at the moment, and at the time of our report, there was uh, completion of wave one, there was uh, getting the wave two activity up and running the way that we've talked about, but also real ambition. You've seen it uh, throughout the report about all the changes to governance arrangements, to ways in which things are, are done, uh, but also that improved planning that's required, that improved financial management that required, and the job of getting the agency from 320 people to where it needs to be. I think at the heart of our, our, our concern that we've expressed about looking forward is that sheer volume of activity and how doable that is. And as, uh, as you've said, uh, there's a timeline set out for that. The questions that we're, we're asking, the challenge that we're putting, is how the detail of how that timeline is going to be delivered, given the, the significant volume of activity. Yes, that's underway, but that needs to be achieved to deliver on those timelines. Thank you very much. Can I just ask, in the compilation of the report, if you talk to any um, recipients of the service, any service users? In relation to this one, we didn't because of the timing of it. We were completing the work in February, which was really just as the first benefits were being done. Um, in future work, we certainly will. Um, it's one of the things we do routinely in our work where that's appropriate. So on early learning and childcare, self-directed support, talking to recipients is a key part of our work, and we'll do that. I think that that's probably leads into another concern, which is whether the, um, this report is timely, um, given that you've not been able to talk to any service recipients, which must be surely a, a fundamental factor in trying to judge whether it's value for money, what, what the people that are actually receiving the service feel. And I have heard you know, accusations that the um, inquiries like this done by uh, the Audit Commission are um, onerous. You've mentioned at the very start that this agency is working flat out. You've just said about all the work that they have to do, and yet they're also having to respond 
to what seems to be a fairly intrusive um, inquiry. Um, it's also the case, I, I don't know, it would be interesting to know what the cost of your inquiry is, whether that's in addition to any internal audit functions which the agency um, has, which is on top of any external audit functions, which is, I, I, it would be interesting to know whether um, those concerns expressed by people about the role of the Commission, especially at this stage, in the early part of the development of this process, is appropriate and proportionate. It's a judgment call we always have to make. Um, I think uh, auditors are sometimes accused of um, coming along after the battle and bayonetting the wounded. There's clearly a limit to how useful we can be if we wait until 2024 and then look back at what had happened over the previous six or seven years. Um, I also think this is such a significant part of the new devolved powers of the Scottish Government and the Parliament. Um, three and a half billion pounds a year of benefits and an impact on the lives of the most vulnerable people in Scotland mm -hmm. that providing assurance to Parliament that it's being delivered well is a worthwhile thing to do. Um, I'm pleased we've been able to give that assurance now um, and I think the letter from the Cabinet Secretary recognises that there are some useful pointers from us over and above what the programme's already aware of for the things that need to be prioritised to get the next wave right, but it is always a judgement call. And in terms of the costs um, of the inquiry you've conducted and other audit costs for um, the public bodies involved? Um, costs of all of our work um, in central government are funded uh, by Parliament through the SCPA. The cost of this piece of work, I think, was about £300,000. Um, and when the annual audit is up and running, there'll be an annual uh, nominal fee for that, which comes through as well. Um, I think against the scale of the setup costs and particularly the continuing delivery, delivery costs, it's a very small element, um, which I hope does provide useful assurance to Parliament about the progress of this really significant policy. And my last point, it would be useful to get, if possible, um, in writing um, afterwards, the point that was made about this being a very important policy, and that's why it's important to get in early on, but also come back to it subsequently. Um, but it is the pattern of, of your work that you've, for example, I know a number of transport projects, ongoing transport projects that you've been involved in as they've been going on. And my concern really is that the work that you do and the demands that you place on the bodies that you're investigating at the time when they're trying to get these things running can be very onerous and actually uh, counterproductive to actually delivering the service. Uh, we work hard to make sure that it's not um, onerous um, and that it is proportionate to uh, the scale of the programmes we're looking at and the risks associated with them. Um, it, it always is um, a challenge to make sure we're not coming in too late for our work to be of value, both to the organisations we're auditing and to Parliament. Uh, so it's not uncommon for us to look at a piece of work as it's underway. We've done that with the uh, major transport projects that you've talked about, things like the Commonwealth Games as well as Social Security Scotland. And the aim is twofold, both to give assurance to Parliament but also to highlight things that can be put right before some of the very significant risks materialise. Um, but if it would be helpful to the committee, I'm very happy to write to you afterwards setting out how we go about that decision making. I could, just my last point, it would be interesting to know, because from what you've just said, there seems to be an awful lot of times when you get involved during the early parts of projects or initiatives rather than waiting to see what's happened and then looking at value for money. So it would be useful to know exactly what criteria are used when you decide that. And if, if this is part of a, a set of priorities that you have at the start, which you apply consistently, or whether it's just taken you know, as things arise, it would be useful to have that information. It's, it's very much part of our program, program development activity and the aim is, as I say, to make sure that where we think it's appropriate, um, we can make sure the building blocks for success are in at an early stage to avoid having to come along later um, and report on something that's gone wrong, but very happy to follow up with the committee. Okay, thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Thank you. Uh, and good morning. A uh, couple of questions or a couple of lines of questions, right? Okay, I suppose the, the first one is, um, obviously the Scottish Government's original plan was to have everything over by the, security, by the agency by 2021. And clearly, from your report, that was probably never going to be likely and possible. I, I suppose the risk now is the relationship with the DWP, both in regard to the financial cost, because my understanding is that the contract had been negotiated for a certain period of time. Now, that's obviously going to have to be extended. Did you look at all at what cost it's going to be for the government to then renegotiate with DWP a fresh contract for them to deliver what the agency was meant to be delivering? 
At, at this stage, we haven't. Um, the uh, announcement about the timeline for transferring existing complaint complainants, claimants, was made um, right as this report was being finalised. It's something I think we will seek to look at um, in future audit work that we carry out, um, and I'd come back to um, recognising the government's commitment to safe and secure delivery of the programme um, and the uh, finding we make in the report about the extent to which the complexity of what's involved is, being, is becoming apparent to everybody, to uh, the social security programme here in Scotland and to DWP as the work progresses. Uh, so we'll look at that in future. I, I, myself, I mean, I just, I, 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 auditing seems to be a very dark art, which goes beyond my intelligence. But uh, in regard to the auditing of the accounts, which obviously will report in the autumn, as you said, would there be some kind of reference to few ongoing costs beyond that? Or would, would that be a separate report you would have to do to audit something that's going forward? It would almost certainly come in the future work. The audit report that will be published in the autumn will look at the 2018-19 accounts for Social Security Scotland, um, and it will look at what's within the agency rather than what's within the wider programme okay. to set this up. Okay. Um, That's very helpful. Uh, yeah. My second area is, is quite specific. Uh, one of the commitments the Scottish Government has given, which I think is very helpful, is to have two or three staff in each place. Um, do you think, from your auditing, that that can be met within the time scales that they'd hope to be have met? And is this another area of concern in regard to recruitment that we're just struggling to find people to do this, or is that an easier than perhaps some of the IT stuff? My understanding is that the government's still looking at its options for how it will do that, and I think Kirsty can tell you a bit more about that. Yeah. As we set out in the report, um, the planning for that local delivery element um, is underway at the moment. It's at an early stage, but we do know there is recruitment ongoing for um, some of the staff that will be required with an aim to have about 100 members of staff in place by the end of this year. I think that recruitment is still underway, um, but there is progress being made on that. We, um, As we report in here about the challenges about recruitment, that's really about the programme side. Um, so the implementation team within the government directorate, whereas we really haven't seen the same recruitment issues for the agency itself. It's had really high level of interest, and in particularly its client-facing roles. Um, so it's just to draw that distinction for you. I, I suppose that just leads me to my kind of just final wee point, is, is in regard to, obviously, we've got the Scottish Government doing a lot of the IT work, procurement stuff, and we've got the agency then delivering it. Again, from the conversations we've had here at committee, there seems to be a good relationship between the agency and the Scottish Government. Um, longer term, would you see them being merged together all into the agency, or do you think there will always have to be some kind of work done by Scottish Government in regard to the bigger pieces of work and the agency delivering it? Or do you think the agency at some point, beyond 2024 probably, will then be able to do everything? And, and, and is that where we should be looking to end up? My expectation is that um, the agency will, as you say, be taking on all of the day-to-day -day operations of the social security system. Um, I think the programme team will certainly reduce in size as all of that set-up work and the transfer is, transfer is completed, and then there'll be a decision to be taken about where the government's social security policy team should sit um, to be continuing the development of um, any new benefits or changes to the eligibility of the existing benefits within the current settlement. Um, so there will still be a need for that capacity. Thank you, and thank you, Camilla. OK, a couple more questions. Shona Robinson, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Um, good morning. Uh, I obviously uh, appreciate that this report is very much focused on the implementation of the devolved powers and focus on Social Security Scotland uh, and so on. However, in your report, you recognise yourself the interface with the DWP, and that's been part of the questioning so far this morning. So if you look at paragraphs 125 to 128, there's a number of references to the ongoing delivery relationship that will need to be carefully managed. Uh, the transfer of people from the DWP systems and benefits to Scottish ones will continue for several years. The concluding sentence of that, that section, the Scottish Government will therefore need a long-term arrangement to verify this information with the DWP. So I guess I'm, my questions are around who audits whether the DWP is doing its job in delivering devolved benefits well. Now, clearly the National Audit Office uh, audits the DWP, but in your methodology in Appendix 1, 
you haven't reviewed or looked at any information uh, from the DWP or the, the UK government. You've not spoken to representatives from the DWP or indeed the National Audit Office. So isn't there a need for some form of auditing of that interface? And is that something that you're going to be looking at in the future? Uh, you're absolutely right, Ms Robeson. This is a new area for everybody involved. Until very recently, the devolution settlement was quite clear. If something wasn't reser res reserved, it was devolved and we audited it. We're now, with Social Security and with taxation, in a position where um, large UK government agencies, DWP and HMRC, are closely involved in delivering things that are devolved to government through the tax and social security powers. Um, there, there's been a conversation between the two governments about the audit and accountability arrangements for that, and a new framework's been agreed just in the last couple of months. Under that framework, I don't have direct rights of access to DWP or indeed HMRC, but there are um, arrangements in place for my teams to work very closely with the teams in the NAO to make sure that between us we are able to cover what's needed and to give the assurance that both of our parliaments need. And Mark can give you more of a flavour of how we've done that in relation to this work. Yeah. The, 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 the framework that the Auditor General refers to, the Audit and Accountability Framework, was a framework that this committee gave comment on an earlier draft and it's only recently been uh, uh, developed and agreed. That gives us the potential to work with colleagues in the National Audit Office to have to, to see the other side of the fence, to see what's happening in DWP, and we'll look to explore how best to do that as we do some of the future reporting in this area. That arrangement was not in place for this report, so we were unable to do that for this report. And what we're only able to do is look from this side of the fence, for the want of a better phrase. Uh, we have some experience with that through the annual audit, which we've referred to a number of times, where we uh, have done some initial work with National Audit Office colleagues to give us the access to the information and the evidence that we need to form an opinion on the accounts and what we do around the audit of the agency in this year. And we'll look to build on that as we go forward to make sure, as we do the work uh, uh, in the years ahead that we've set out, that we are able to have a balanced view of what's happening at the Scottish end, but also uh, how DWP are contributing to that. So, just, just to be clear, what you're saying is that now the new framework is in place, future reports like this we would expect to see in the, the methodology um, discussions having taken place with the NAO um, and that that would be reflected within the, the body of, of the report. Is, is that what you're saying? Um, I, I hope so. The framework um, gives me um, the ability to carry out direct audit work of DWP with the agreement of DWP and the NAO. As Mark says, we're still testing out what that means. There's a commitment from, from all parties to make this work, but we haven't yet had the chance to do it in, in practice. I share your concern that we need to be able to look at some of this directly to be able to draw conclusions for how well things are working in Scotland and where, where things need to improve. Okay. Okay. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to explore a couple of things, but I'd, I'd like to start firstly just to, to revisit some of the staff vacancy side. Um, you talked about a 30% staff vacancy in here, and, and you've mentioned it again today in your evidence. When we heard from the Cabinet Secretary, she said you had taken a figure at December um, and that that actually was misleading because the total figure required was for the full year and that they hadn't finished recruiting because they didn't need them between December up till December, and they were going to have them all in by the sort of end of the year. Um, she did um, s suggest that they, they hadn't made the total figure, but I just wanted to put that to you. Would, is that a correct understanding that she gave us, that you had misunderstood the numbers? Our report was finalised at the end of February, um, and obviously with vacancy rates, their figures at a point in time. Um, we know there is continuing recruitment going on, um, and I'm not sure if Kirsty can provide us an update with that. Um, but before I ask Kirsty to add a bit more, I'd say the other thing we're concerned about has been high levels of turnover in some key posts. So you'll see we refer particularly to the programme manager, the three different post holders over a period of time, and an interim person at the time we finalised it. So we recognise the work that's going on to fill the vacancies, and it hasn't been straightforward to do that. Kirsty, can you add a bit more detail? Yeah, as the Auditor General has mentioned, um, at the time of reporting, and indeed now we're aware there is an enormous amount of recruitment ongoing within the programme. Um, so the position we've reflected in the report is, as it was when we were looking at it, um, that will indeed, I'm sure, move in 
rates like this would fluctuate. Um, but it's also the position we're reflecting kind of reflects our wider picture that we saw when we were out speaking to people within the programme that of the recruitment challenges and um, how they were having to manage vacancies. Um, so that gives them maybe a wider picture about that number. Mm -hmm. the, the, they gave quite credible evidence about the fact that they would, um, if you like, backstop the uh, difficulty in recruiting the skills needed by training them in-house. Did you see any evidence of, of that development? Do, do you think that is viable within the current strains? Yeah, so we did see evidence of that. I mean, I think what the, the programmes really tend to take quite a kind of pragmatic approach to, to fill in mm -hmm. the vacancies. It, it kind of appreciates, particularly on the digital side, the, the, what, the issues within the wider market and that kind of, I suppose, that very realistic approach that it's very unlikely that it will always be able to fill all the vacancies that, that, that it has um, given, given that external market conditions. So... Um, looking at other ways to be able to, to, to bring in those skills. One of those is exactly that, growing their own. Um, the Social Security programme, uh, being a kind of programme of its size, offers great opportunities for uh, mm. um, being able to do that and for those people to get those skills and then to work on other projects around the Scottish Government as well. So they are looking at that and working with colleagues within the Digital Directorate who are just creating um, essentially kind of new professional communities around some of those skills mm. as a way of being able to, to grow that. So they're working very closely closely with the digital director and also places like the digital academy to make sure that those those skills are, are being brought through obviously that's that's not a short-term fix that's very much a kind of longer term game but that is something that they are working on at the moment and will they be able to because obviously with the retention issue obviously the key thing for developing your own skills is having the, the skills in the first place to actually share and and develop so you know are they are they going to be recruiting specifically was there any signs that they're allocating that as a job or is it just by, by osmosis from the people in post? How? So in terms of actually having, I suppose, having people there who are, kind of manage the recruitment, is that, is that the question you're asking? No, well? actually, I mean, I mean, to develop your own, you've got to have people actually doing the training, giving benefit of their experience and enabling people to, empowering people to learn and, and develop on the job. So uh, um, if they're under pressure already, which your report indicates they are, I'm just wondering how the capacity is being built in the system to actually allow that to happen. I mean, I think it is the right way to go and it's laudable, but I'm just wondering how that will sit alongside that strain of, of in workforce capacity. I suppose there's a, there's a, a couple of elements to that. Um, I suppose some of the things that we saw was, I suppose, one, them working very closely with Digital Directorate to make use of the capacity mm -hmm. within the Digital Directorate and some of the programmes that they have ongoing in terms of kind of build, bring bringing in that wider government position in terms of making sure that wider government has got the, the people it needs. And also the way of working um, within the programme in terms of, we talk about multidisciplinary teams within the Agile approach, which is where each team brings in all the different people with different skills together. And that allows for some of that learning on the job um, and lessons learned. And we've seen, again, them having regular lessons learned sessions. I think um, what I would say, though, is that kind of it comes back to some of the points that we were talking about earlier, around about that critical path, around about that needing then to be supported by a workforce plan, which clearly shows and predicts kind of what are some of the key skills that are going to be needed, when will they be needed, when can people, when will the skills kind of move between the different projects, so that there is that longer term planning to understand well actually what are some of those critical skills going to be, and what actions can we do now to make sure that when we need those people, they are in place. So there are absolutely doing some things at the moment but it forms part of that wider critical path and workforce planning which is so crucial which uh, leads me very nicely into the, the second part of things that I want to ask about and that's around risk management because although you talk about a lot of risk through the report um, I, w I didn't come away from it with a real sense of how is risk managed you know is there a, a risk management system in place is there some sort of rag system um, and it, if so does your analysis concur with the analysis of risk that is made within the directorate? And aligning to that, um, when you look at the financial analysis of, of what it's costing and the budget flexibility, obviously the time goes out, but the recruitment is in place or coming into place, but the time frame is stretched, clearly then the budget 
will be stretched too. But the multidisciplinary working and the cross-working across the digital directorate, how, again, is that cost and risk managed? Because, you know, it, obviously, the, when you're pulling from all places, the budget may be picking from other budgets as well. So I'm just wondering how that's, that's been managed and whether you can follow that. I don't think we've ever, ever been asked directly about risk management arrangements before, so thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, it's clearly something we are looking at closely. Um, I think that's a good example of um, the finding we make in the report, that the governance arrangements that have been in place so far have been good and fit for purpose and aren't sufficient for um, what will be needed for wave two as the scale and pace ramps up. Um, Gemma, you've seen it directly. Do you want to give a sense of, of your um, perspective on risk management? Absolutely. I think and we, what we say in the report is that this is, this is actually a well-managed programme in terms of the programme documentation and some of the systems it has in place. They're certainly among some of the best that we've seen across kind of, you know, large-scale programmes in government. That's the same with its risk management approach. It's got quite a thorough approach to risk management and certainly all the kind of documentation and, and systems that we would expect them to have in place and regular consideration of those risks. Um, what we see when we look at the risk register is that one of their top risks, for example, is um, vacancies, staff vacancies, staff turnover. So we do see, we do recognise when we look at their risk register some of the risks that we see ourselves on there, which again gives that assurance is that, that, that risk management processes are looking at, at, at the right issues. So um, as the Auditor General said, it will will be one of those things that will need to be looked at um, and refined as going into wave two to make sure that it's picking up on the interdependencies and, and the complex nature of some of those risks, but absolutely the terms of the documentation, the systems and building block, and also, I suppose, their attitude to risk and how seriously they, they take looking at that, those building blocks are, are well in place within the programme. Okay. Thank you. Okay, a, a final question from Keith Brown. I was just interested in that uh, last exchange where you mentioned you're looking forward and said that what the government have is insufficient for what's about to come, which again stretches my understanding of the remit of the Commission, which is now looking forward to what the government's going to do and, and making comment on that. But you, you mentioned earlier on that you saw the role as um, being so that we, the Commission, can ensure the building blocks are in place. And I just wondered the extent to which you felt that was your responsibility and what, if it is responsibility of the government of the day, the elected government, which is going to be held accountable for this, what their responsibility in relation is to that? Is it subordinate to yours or how does it work? Of course not. It is the, the government's responsibility both to set the policy and to implement and deliver it. Um, my responsibility is, report, is to report to this parliament um, on how well they do that. Um, sometimes, as you say, we do that after the fact. Um, sometimes when there are really big and complex pro programmes and projects like this, we'll do it um, during the process to provide assurance that those building bo blocks are in place when there's still room for improvement. Um, and I'm really pleased that we've been able to say in this case that um, the foundations have been set well in place and the first wave commitments have been delivered and to give this committee and the parliament more widely an indication that the next wave will be much more challenging. Government is aware of that and is doing the right things, but there, there are still significant risks that need to be managed. That's my job. Okay. I think unless there's oh, a final question, so, so that wasn't the final question. This is the final question, I mean, again, Jeremy so Balfour. I, it's going a wee bit back to the previous question. I, I suppose, I, and I, you know, put it on record that I lived through the tram tobacco here in Edinburgh as a local councillor, and on a number of occasions, your predecessors did reports, and they were all very positive. You know, it's all going well, it's all going well, and then. Obviously, it didn't go well. I mean, I suppose my question, my miss, is, is how robust can you be, and are you able, in a both a positive and negative way, to to highlight things at an early stage in regard to that? Because I think one of the things I was frustrated about as a local councillor was we got all these reports telling everything was fine, and then it went wrong. And I think as politicians and more to the point as a public, we'd much rather know at an earlier stage. If things aren't going on time, aren't going right, so we can then respond to that. Are you confident that you can be robust enough to do that? It's fair, and just uh, in terms of, I thought it was a really f fascinating question in terms of the tram tobacco. It's what worth noting for anyone listening. It, it might be worth checking out the 
the speech from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, John Swinney, at the time in relation to the half a billion pounds mm -hmm. for trams mm -hmm. and what the Scottish Government position was in relation to the business plan for that, given the fact what we're doing here today is scrutinising the Scottish Government's delivery of a service rather than a particular local authority, but any comparisons would be very welcome. Uh, That's really helpful, Convener. Thank you. I should just, for the record, be clear that the um, I've been Auditor General since 2012, so those reports predated my um, responsibility in this area. Um, and I don't audit local authorities, just for the record. Um, but I, I think in some ways the answer to your question, Mr Balfour, comes back to the questions that Ms Ballantyne was asking. We can't give a guarantee that something is going to succeed or fail. N nobody can do that if we're looking forward. What we can do is look at the risks that are involved, the way those risks are being managed, um, and the extent to which people are, are understanding the whole picture. Um, we say clearly in this report we think um, that the foundations are in place and that the first wave has been delivered well and we're giving this committee an indication that wave two becomes much more complex very quickly and there are risks that need to be managed. You've got my assurance that we think risk management is good, the programme is self-aware and there are some really big and complex things in here around the availability of the right people, the um, complexity of the digital solutions that are needed and the interaction with DWP that would not be easy in any Everybody's management of the programme. That's what we're here to give you. Thank you. And I'm very pleased we're scrutinising the delivery of Wave 1 and Wave 2 variants of the new Scottish Social Security system and not doing an inquiry into the Edinburgh Thrams project. I think this might be a lot more straightforward, despite its uh, complex nature. Uh, thank you uh, to yourself, Auditor General, and uh, your entire team for coming along and providing evidence uh, this morning. We, we very much appreciate your, your time and your expertise and your information. Um, that concludes this particular evidence session and we now move to the next agenda item which we are agreed to take in private. So we move into private session. Thank you.